All right, good evening. Uh, at this time, I'm going to share a little bit of the testimony of how I became a Christian and also my testimony of how I've been called into ministry and my ministry life since then. Now, I've shared so many of the parts of my story before publicly that I always get a little bit afraid that people are getting bored hearing it over and over again, but I'm going to give you sort of the whole story together tonight. And so I grew up in San Diego, California, and I did not grow up in a Christian family. What happened is that my mom was one of eight, and my whole family grew up in a, what we would call a go-in and blow-in church. And what that means is a church that is exploding with life and growth. And my family, my grandma, my grandpa, and the eight kids, uh, they were just everything in the church. They were the bus drivers, and they were the kids' preschool directors, and they were everything. Well, the pastor of that church fell into not only terrible sin, but multiple varieties of terrible sin. And most of my family never set foot again in a church. And so I grew up in a family like that, not growing into church. And when I was young, there was a lot of bad stuff that happened in my family. Probably the one that broke my heart the most was my father leaving when I was young. So my mother and my father were never married, but my father did leave when I was very young. And so every day of my life, I asked myself the question, what was so unlovable about me that my dad didn't want to stick around? Now, the fact that I'm older now, I can look back and realize that the situation was much more complicated than that reduced question, but that's what I asked myself every second of every day. And then there were other things that happened that were not good. And so I grew up filled with anger and depression. I was just the maddest, saddest little kid you'd ever met. And it got so bad that by the time I was eight years old, I decided that I didn't want to feel this kind of pain anymore, and I don't want to live in a world like this anymore. And so at eight, I decided that I would take my own life. And I had seen a show called Unsolved Mysteries. Does anybody remember Unsolved Mysteries with Joe Walsh? Okay, Joe Walsh, John Walsh? Anyway, some guy. But on there, I had seen an episode about someone who had electrocuted themselves to death. And so I thought, you know, that seems like the easiest way to go. And so I was setting up, getting ready to electrocute myself to death. And right before I was about to do it, my mom walked in and saw what I was doing and was understandably alarmed and stopped me. And she put me in years of secular therapy. And in secular therapy, I was diagnosed clinically depressed and suicidal, obviously. And, you know, secular therapy helped with some of the symptoms of my pain, but it couldn't solve the source. It felt a little bit like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. And so when I got into my teenage years, I started trying to solve that source of my pain with sin. And I got caught up in drugs and alcohol and fighting, and believe it or not, I was in a little wannabe gang for a while, and all sorts of terrible stuff. I was in trouble at school. I was in trouble at home. I was a miserable person to be around. I don't think anyone wanted to be around me, and probably everyone hated the sight of me. And honestly, that was sort of my goal in life, to make myself as unlovable as possible. And when I became a teenager and started doing all this sin, the sin didn't solve the source of the pain. In fact, the more sin I did, the more miserable I became. And it was just a downward spiral. And finally, when I was 16 years old, my big day came. There was a man standing outside of my high school. He was a Gideon. And so do we have any Gideons in here? I know Steve's in here somewhere, Randy. So um, he was a Gideon. They're the people who put Bibles in hotel rooms, but they also pass them out on street corners. And so they were standing outside of my high school, passing out free Bibles, and the man handed a Bible to me. And at first I thought, what do I want this stupid thing? And I was going to toss it in the gutter, but the guy was right there, so I thought, mm, I'll put it in my backpack, and then when I get around the corner, then I'll throw it in the gutter. But the corner was a long way away, and I forgot about it. And later on that day, I remembered, wait a minute, I still have that little Bible booklet thing. Here's what happened. I wrestled for 12 years of my life, and that day we had a wrestling duel meet, and something happened that day that never happened again in 12 years of wrestling. The other team was late for the competition. And this was back before the days of cell phones, so some of you can remember those days. And so we had already pulled out the mats, we had taped the mats, we had mopped the mats, we had pulled out the bleachers, we had pulled out the scales, nobody to wrestle. So we're sitting there in the bleachers, bored, wondering if the other team's ever gonna show up. And it was in that moment that I thought about that little Bible booklet thing. And I said, you know what? There's a lot of commotion about this Bible. People fight wars over it. I had a friend who was a goth who had burned a Bible. People pass it out on street corners. And so I said, I'm going to find out what all the fuss is about. And so I opened it up randomly, and I started reading. 
And I still remember the verse that I opened up to, which even though it was 22 years ago, yeah, 22 years ago, um, it was a proverb that says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Now, that's not a verse, anything about salvation or how to believe in Jesus, but the Holy Spirit used it. And in that moment, there was something inside of me that said, this is true. And so I kept reading and I kept reading and I said, that's it. Whoever wrote this book, whatever they want for my life, that's what I want. Well, the other team showed up. And so we got to wrestle. I don't remember if I won or lost that night. But after the dual meet, I went home and I pulled out that little Bible that Gideon had given me. Now, another part of the story, which I don't always share because it's a little complicated, is that my grandpa, who I don't think was a believer at the time, a couple years later had given me a gospel track. And when he gave it to me, I didn't read it. I just threw it in the mountain of trash that's in the corner of my bedroom. And two years later, that mountain of trash in the corner of my bedroom had not moved. It had not changed. It had only grown a little bit. And so I got that Gideon Bible out. I turned to the front cover. And if you've ever seen a Gideon New Testament, there's a gospel track in the front cover. So I opened that up. I remembered that my grandpa had given me something like that two years earlier. So I dug through the mountain of trash in my bedroom until I found that one. I set them both side by side, and I read them both. And it was that day that I read that I was a sinner. Now, I think I knew that I was a sinner, but I don't think I knew what, what terrible condition I was in and, and what disaster I was headed for. But that day I read that because of my sin, I deserved the eternal judgment of hell. And I started thinking about all the things I had done, and I said, you know, that, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. And so I kept reading, and I found out the best news that I had ever heard, that God loved me. I mean, I don't think anybody loved me. My mom kind of like had to love me because that's her job as a mom, right? But I mean, it was probably just her. And so um, I thought, God loved me? God loves me? He knows everything I've ever done, and he still loves me? And then I kept reading, and I read that God loved me so much that he sent Jesus to die for my sins. And that if I would just turn away from my old life and believe in him, I could be saved. And so I thought, this is the best deal I've ever heard. This is a no-brainer. And so I knelt down on the edge of my bed, and I said, God, I barely even know who you are, but please come and save me. And something happened. Now I have words for it. I have words like born again and regeneration and, and things like that. At the time, I didn't have any of those words. All I knew is that it felt like I'd been set free. It felt like there'd been a weight that had been lifted off my back. And it was the first time in my life that I knew what it felt like to experience joy and peace and purpose. And so it was like the sky was bluer and the grass was greener or something. And so the next day I went to school and we had wrestling practice like we always had. And so I went to wrestling practice and I said something to my teammates. Now, I don't remember exactly what I said. I didn't have any churchy words at the time, but I think I said something like, hey guys, I prayed to Jesus last night. And one of them, who's my best friend on the team named Chris Chambers, he said, okay, you better start coming to church with me. So I said, okay. So that Sunday, I started going to church at Chris's family's church. Now, Chris just so happened to be African-American, and the church that he took me to just so happened to be an all-African-American church. So here I am, a 16-year-old white kid, being brought to this African-American church and not sure what to expect. You know, what would they think of me when I walk in? Would they accept me? Would everybody turn and gasp, like, what are you doing here? I mean, what would happen? And I'll never forget because that day, in the first week of being saved, set a course of what ministry was supposed to be like for the rest of my life. I walked in, and they did not hesitate. They did not stutter. They did not bat an eyelash. They opened up their arms, figuratively and literally, and just welcomed me in and loved me to death. Now, I don't know if someone warned them. So I don't know if, if maybe Chris's mom called and said, hey, I'm bringing this kid, just want to warn you. I don't know. But they seemed super duper prepared and just, just took me in and loved me to death. Uh, when me and Chris placed in the state championships, our church threw a party. When me and Chris and Chris's cousins graduated high school, they threw another party. Before I left, Chris's family told me that I was a part of their family. And so that set a mark for the rest of my ministry, seeing them loving everybody no matter what no matter what they looked like or how different they were. So then one year after getting saved, 
um, I moved here to Bakersfield to wrestle for Cal State Bakersfield and to pursue a biology degree here at Cal State Bakersfield. And so the first day that I was here, I lived out on Rosedale and Carriage, and I rode my bike to the closest church to my house. I didn't have a car, so I had a bike. And by the way, it was the middle of July. So I rode my bike to the closest church to my house, which at the time was Rosedale Bible Church, which is the Mennonite church there on Rosedale. So um, I walked in completely soaked in sweat from biking to church in the middle of July. And it was, it was a wonderful church. When I got back, um, two of my six teammates, six roommates, excuse me, uh, asked me, they said, where did you go this morning? And I said, I went to church. And they said, why don't you start coming with us? And I thought, oh, thank goodness, they have a car with air conditioning. <laughs> Wherever you're going, I'm going, it's fine. And so that Wednesday night, they took me here to Valley Baptist Church. And I will never forget it. I remember the sermon. This was 21 years ago. Um, it was on um, Elijah on Mount Carmel. And it was a guest speaker that night. So it wasn't even any of our regular preachers. But it was a guest speaker, and I had never heard preaching like that. I'm guessing there's a lot of people in this room who experienced that moment where you come to Valley and you go, oh, whoa, what is going on here? I didn't even know churches like this existed, right? And so I was just hooked. And so I started coming, and that Sunday I was in a college adult Sunday school class, what we now call life groups. And it was such a blessing in my young Christian life to be a part of a, of a life group. And in that life group, the first life group I was in was led by the Legans and the Leonards. So if any of you know them, they were my very first Sunday school teachers here at the church. Um, however, however, a few months after I started going, the pastor came in and said, hey, we're starting a new life group. We need volunteers to go start a new life group. Is there anyone who would like to volunteer to go start a new life group? So I said, I'll go. So I went to help start this new life group. And my, the leaders of that new life group heavily invested in my life. And so that was, um, that was Ross and Jennifer McFadden and Mike and Sheila Heber. My, Sheila, you know, was at the 8 o'clock uh, service this morning. I was talking to her this morning. And so they invested in my life, and boy, was it a blessing in my life. They weren't the only people who invested in my life. There were other godly men, including pastors at this church who discipled me and who invested in my life. And so I started serving. My very first position is, um, volunteer position in the church, is I was a care group leader for our college life group. So I made my contacts, you know, every week. So if you're a care group leader, God bless you. I appreciate your ministry. That was my very first ministry role here at the church. Uh, then I, I became what was called the Cal State liaison, which basically meant if we were trying to do any outreaches at Cal State, I was the one who would talk to the Cal State administration and try to get them to, you know, agree to let us do these evangelistic outreaches at the college. Um, and then also I would help set up chairs every week which, by the way, I think I've done that every week of 22 years of being a Christian. But anyways, um, so I started volunteering in the church. A couple years after volunteering in the church and getting heavily, heavily involved in the, the college ministry, uh, there was a new girl at college ministry one night. And so her name was Faith Spradlin. And she was sitting in front of me, and it was handshake time. It was greeting time. And she turned around, and I was immediately interested in her. And um, I said, hi, my name's Brian. And she said, oh, my name's Faith. And I said, oh, okay. She said, I'm Andrew's sister. And so I said, I thought to myself, wait a minute. This is a Spradlin. And I thought every other Spradlin I know is the most hardcore Christians I've ever met. And so I thought, I bet this girl loves Jesus. So I spent eight months half figuring out if she really loved Jesus, and boy, did she, and half getting up my nerve to ask her out. So it took me eight months to ask her out. Part of it is I thought she's way out of my league. She's never going to say yes. The other half of it is I thought, this is the pastor's daughter. If this goes south, do I get like excommunicated or <laughs> kicked out of the church? Or like, what happens if this doesn't go well, right? So I spent eight months on a creeping approach till I finally asked her out. Um, okay, now, uh, about two weeks before I asked her out, her brother, Matt Spradlin, who was a pastor here, called me and said he wanted to meet with me. And I thought, oh no. This guy's going to say, stay with my sister, you deadbeat. You're not good enough. <laughs> so for a couple days, I was dreading the meeting, and I thought, oh, I was spending eight months getting up the courage to ask her out, and now this guy's going to say, stay away. And so finally, we get into the meeting, and he says, hey, uh, I'm the pastor of evangelism here at the church, and I'm looking to hire a part-time intern in the evangelism department, and I'd like to offer you that job if you were interested. And so I was totally just kind of shocked. Whoa, 
you know, I, I walked in thinking I was about to lose a potential girlfriend, and all of a sudden I was getting offered a job, and so I said, uh, sure, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that. He said, okay, great. So um, I started serving the, in the church as an evangelism intern, and to this day, that might be, I've had many ministry jobs, but that might be my favorite ministry job I've ever had. Here's what happened, is at Tuesday Night Grow, we can never visit all the people who were visiting the church. And so after Grow every Tuesday night, there was still a pile of people left to visit. And so my job was I worked eight hours a week, and on Sundays, not Sundays, excuse me, Saturdays, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., I just drove all over Bakersfield visiting all the families who visited the church. And I loved it. I would just try to lead them to Christ. I would try to talk to them about getting baptized. I would try to get them plugged into a life group and talk to them about joining the church. And it just, it was everything I love. And so it was wonderful. Then um, after a while, they, uh, the staff wanted to add some additional responsibility to my plate and move me full time. So I started being in charge of our telephone ministry, which I still sort of am decades later. Uh, but, and then also, um, we, we purchased a building downtown on the corner of 18th and O that at the time we called the Downtown Ministry Center. And so part of my full-time now position was being the director of that building down there. Well, I was still sort of a glorified intern at that point, which meant that I got invited to the intern meetings. Now, what are the intern meetings? The intern meetings, we have, at the time we had maybe 13 interns in the church, um, and we would get together each week, and Pastor Roger, Pastor Phil, and Pastor Andrew would be there, and we could ask them any question we wanted to ask them about theology or ministry or church or Bible or, or Christian living or whatever we wanted. Sometimes they'd have lessons for us. Usually it was just kind of Q&A. And I remember one day we were having a pretty heated discussion. They often got sometimes heated discussions. And we were having a heated debate on some issue. I forget what it was. But Pastor Phil interrupted the whole heated debate, and he pointed straight at me, and he said, Brian? He said, have you ever felt called into full-time ministry? Now, keep in mind, I was working in full-time ministry, but I knew what he meant because although I was working in full-time ministry, I was finishing up my degree in biology to become a high school biology teacher. And so he meant full-time for the rest of your life, that it's your sort of vocation and your calling and your career from here on out. And so I said, um, no, Pastor Phil, I've never felt that calling. I said, but, I mean, I love ministry, so I wouldn't mind that. Well, again, something happened. And I don't exactly know how to explain it, but it was like there was an anvil on my back. It was like there was a weight. It was like there was a hand saying, do this, do this, do this. And a lot of guys fight their call to ministry, but I welcomed it because I loved ministry. But I thought, I'm gonna take three days to pray and make sure this is God's will and not the flu or some bad pizza or something like that. <laughs> and so I spent three days praying about it. That anvil was persistently there. And so I came back and met with Pastor Roger and Pastor Phil, and I said, um, guys, I think I am called to ministry. And they said, yeah, we know you are. And so they said, <laughs> they said we're going to start training you, and you need to go to seminary. So I said, okay. Um, so they started training me, and I started preparing for seminary. And I also told my girlfriend at the time, Faith, I told her, um, hey, I'm getting called into ministry, and I'm going to be moving away to go to seminary, hint, hint, kind of. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit later, I proposed to Faith. By God's amazing grace, she said yes. And um, we got married, went on our honeymoon, came back, packed up, moved to Kentucky, and started seminary and got two new jobs and a new apartment all in the same month. And so we just started all over in Louisville, Kentucky. And so there I was attending the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where I eventually got my degree, which was a Master's of Divinity and Pastoral Studies. Um, as soon as I graduated, I uh, had a position waiting for me to be the associate pastor of Copper Springs Church in Clovis, uh, California, so a couple hours north of here. And that was a wonderful experience. When I went, um, the pastor, who was Matt Spradlin, he had moved up there, he said, Brian, I'll let you do whatever you want in the church. What do you want to do? And I said, I want small groups, evangelism, and missions. He said, okay. So that's what he gave me, and we had a wonderful time there. Then, five years later, I felt God calling me back here to Valley. Now, part of that calling was that uh, I was getting some calls from Roger and Phil and others, uh, encouraged me and, and, and asked me to come back. And at the time, I had no desire to leave. I loved Copper Springs. I, I planned on spending the rest of my time there. But the more I prayed about it, the more God made it clear in my heart that he wanted me to come back. And so I came back to be on staff for the second time here at Valley Baptist, and this stint, I have been on staff for seven years now 
If you put the seven plus the two before, then I've been on staff uh, for nine years. And so, a few months ago, Pastor Andrew came to me and said, Brian, I would like you to pray about and consider us being co-senior pastors. Now, it has never been my ambition to be a co-senior pastor. I would be completely happy having never been a co-senior pastor. But as Andrew started explaining to me the, the reasons he wanted me to consider it, I saw the wisdom in it, and all of it, to me, made complete sense. And so I think there's a lot of strengths to the co-senior pastoring model, strengths that we've seen with Roger and Phil for, for decades and decades. Um, for example, one is just sharing the load. Senior pastor is brutal. It is a brutal, brutal job. I mean, the buck stops there. There's nowhere else for it to go, right? And so it is a ton of hard work. Remember, Jesus said, the greatest among you is the one who serves. And so I know that senior pastor actually means senior servant. Senior pastor means the one in the church who is responsible to sacrifice and serve more than anyone else in the church. And so helping share that load so Andrew doesn't bear the full weight of that, I think is a huge, a huge benefit to this plan that we share that load. I think another benefit of the plan is that we complement each other. So me and Pastor Andrew have the same heart. We have the same philosophy of ministry. We have the same doctrinal beliefs, but we are two different people. And I think that our strengths complement each other and help, help fill in each other. Another advantage of the plan, which was one of Pastor Andrew's main reasons he wanted to co-senior pastor, was accountability. It's hard to be held accountable when everybody on the staff, you're their boss. That puts them in an unwinnable situation of holding you accountable. The brilliance of co-senior pastors is there is somebody on the staff that you are not their boss. And therefore, they are free to hold each other accountable without their job in any way being in jeopardy. And there's other benefits besides that. So I guess there's my whole life story put together at once, which um, brings me kind of to this moment. So Q&A time, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, any questions for Brian, for Andrew, for Phil and I, just come to a mic and State your question. Hey, Joseph. Hi, Joseph Chrysostomo. My question's real easy, so you can take a deep breath. Uh, this is the same question I asked Pastor Andrew at his Q&A as well, which pertains to family and marriage. Um, you have a young family, school-age daughters. Um, and so my question is what safeguards you've placed, just in general, to uh, commit to your responsibilities and your ministry to your family first. Yeah, great in question. other words, what, what does faith think about all of this? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So Joseph, I appreciate that question. Um, it's something I've thought about long before the question of coaching your pastors. So anytime you're in ministry, you have to answer the question of how do I do ministry without forsaking and ruining my family? And so that's a great question. Now, I don't know that I've always been perfect at the ballots. And so I'm a workaholic, and I have had times in my life where I think I was unbalanced in how much time that I've spent at church versus how much time I spend at home. I hope that I've learned from some of those mistakes, and I want to share with you some of the conclusions that I've learned from that. First of all, I only do two things in life. I do church, and I do family. And so that's what I do. So one thing I've tried to do is I've tried to jettison out everything else in life. Um, so when I was walking up, someone jokingly asked me, Brian, I'm going to ask you a softball question. I think everybody's worried about me tonight for some reason. So anyways, but he said, I'm going to ask you a softball question. I'm going to ask you, you know, what's your favorite football team? And I just said, I don't, I don't really watch football. And so I've jettisoned everything out of my life that is not church and family. So when I'm not doing church, then I'm doing family hardcore, 100% present with my family. So I think that's a big thing. I think there's a lot of pastors who maybe have more time than they know that they have, but when they're on their free time, they're not maximizing that free time with their family. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing is that years ago, probably eight years ago, um, my wife and I worked on a plan of having a family night each week. So Monday evening is our family nights. And so I tried the best that I can. In the last eight years, there might have been two or three emergencies where there's something else I need to do. But I try my best to keep Monday nights as family night. 
So by the way, if you call me or text me and ask me to do anything on a Monday night, I'm probably gonna say no. Now, there are exceptions. Of course, if someone's dying or something like that, I have made exceptions in the past. But there's a lot of things that there's six other days in the week that I'm completely, well, you know what? Let's say this, six other evenings and seven other days in the week uh, that I'm, I'm pretty much always available. So my point is we try to really protect Monday nights and, and I think I've done a, a decent job of that over these last eight years. Um, the other thing that I try to do is I try my best to be there for bedtime. And if you've ever had little kids, bedtime's an important moment. And so I have so many church responsibilities, but I try my best to be home for bedtime. And in my house, I'm, I do the bedtime routine because I want to, because I want to be there. And so um, I tuck my girls into bed, and of course my wife comes in and says goodnight and stuff. But uh, I have chosen that I'm the one who reads the Bible with them, that I'm the one who sort of prays with them before sleep. Um, and, you know, that's a precious time. And so I've found that that 10 to 15 minutes right before bed can go a long, long way. The other thing is I've tried more and more, especially as my girls get older, to include my girls in on my ministry. Now, my wife, Faith, is already included on a lot of my ministry. So if, you know, if you're a pastor's wife, you, you know, how do I say this? You are already signed up for a lot of ministry. Let me say that. And so there's a lot of counseling that Faith does with me. Uh, my life group ministry, Faith does with me. There's a ton of ministry that we do um, together. But now my girls are getting old enough where really, as a family, we've increased the amount of things we do together in ministry. For example, for the last uh, two months that I've been at the All Drive campus, my family and I have been greeting together before the eight o'clock service, and that's something we do together. The other thing is just three weeks ago, we went together as a family on a Honduras mission trip. And so that was something we did together. In the past, a mission trip always meant that I was away from my family. Now, the girls are old enough that we can all go together and mission trips don't have to mean that I'm away from my family for a week. And so those are some of the things that I've tried to put in place. I don't think I have always gotten the balance right and I'm not sure I, I still have it right. Uh, but I love my family, I love being with them and I've tried to increase, increase those safeguards. The other thing I try to do is to actually use my vacation time. So I've never successfully done it yet, but I have increased the percentage of the vacation time that I'm given that I'm actually using. And so I do think I've made gigantic strides um, in taking vacation time. So, good question. All right, other questions? Hey, Fred, how are you? So this is for both Brian and Andrew. Uh, I am so excited that the church decided that they didn't need to go outside of the church to find a senior pastor. Um, and I think that's a testament to the board and everybody else that, that was a part of that. But I'm assuming that um, the young guys potentially may see things different than Roger and, and, and Phil, that you may have some, uh, you know, coming out of the gate, this is what we're going to stress, we're going to emphasize. What, what do you see as the future of the church? So, Fred, in some ways, those are two different questions. So that's the question, what is our vision for the future of the church, which is what's been getting promised on the video for, you know, four weeks. In fact, my daughter, Abby, asked, uh, she said, can I, you know, she's recently become a member because she's baptized. She said, can I ask a question tonight? And uh, Faith said, first, well, first of all, she's not old enough, according to our bylaws. That's one of the things we're addressing. But she's not old enough to vote. Um, but Faith asked her, what question would you ask? And she said, I want to know the vision they have for the church. And that's because I think she's, you know, seen it promised for, uh, for, you know, a few weeks now. So you've asked, what is the vision for the church? And then I guess you've sort of asked, what if there's people on staff who perhaps don't like the fact that we're becoming senior pastors or don't agree with um, the vision we have for the church? So let me maybe start with the first part of the question. So when it comes for the vision of the church, um, I am a little bit behind. The reason is Pastor Andrew was elected first to be the senior pastor elect. And at that point, there were no concrete plans for me ever becoming the co-senior pastor. Now that's a conversation that's been raised many times. Um, that is something the congregation has asked over and over and over and over again over the years. 
but we never had any sort of official plans that that was the direction we wanted to go. So my point is, is I've intentionally been gearing myself up to implement Andrew's vision for the future of our church. And so I'm a little bit behind. In other words, Andrew has a head start on me on the vision of the church. However, uh, Pastor Andrew and myself have worked together many, many years in ministry. And um, I think, you know, we know what our vision is. So we worked together before when I was on staff here at Valley. We worked together when we were both at the same church in Kentucky. And then now we've worked together again here at Valley. And so we've had three different opportunities to work together in ministry. And so thoroughly know each other and each other's, you know, ministry passions and direction and vision. Besides that, we are brothers-in-laws, which means that we have talked about theology and church at many a family vacation and many a family holiday when our wives sort of wish that we would, you know, engage and, and have fun at the, um, the uh, holiday instead of uh, engaging in passionate, you know, ministry dreaming. But anyways, um, so we've had incredible opportunities to talk about that kind of stuff. And so I think I can speak to both of us that our vision for Valley Baptist Church is not drastically different, or very much different at all, than the vision that Pastor Phil and Pastor Roger have had for, for the 36 and a half years of Valley's history. For 36 and a half years, this church has been focused on making disciples by expository preaching, small groups, and aggressive intentional evangelism. And I know for Pastor Andrew and myself that that is the the vision and thrust that we want to continue to have for the church, that the goal and focus of our church is the Great Commission, to make disciples, and that the ways we go about that is by expository preaching, a strong emphasis on mutual edification through small groups, and intentional, aggressive evangelism, both here and around the world. Now, every little detail of what exactly that means in the years to come, I don't know. Uh, you know, we haven't fully formulated every detail that that might, could be. And even details that we will formulate, I'm sure will change over the years because things change, the ministry changes, and so those details get changed. But I know that our ministry is to make disciples through expository preaching, a even stronger emphasis on small groups than the strong emphasis we've always had, and then a emphasis on reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ through aggressive, intentional evangelism of all kinds. Now, I will add one detail that we really do want to focus on in, in the days to come is an emphasis on investing in and spending time with our volunteers. So if our church was only as strong as our pastors, it wouldn't be very strong. But praise the Lord that we have over a thousand people in our church who are serving in ongoing volunteer positions within our church. Part of the reason Valley Baptist is so strong is because of God's grace working through an army of over a thousand volunteers. And in Ephesians 4, we find that one of the main jobs of a pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And we believe the saints are the members of the church. So congratulations, you may not have known it, but according to the Bible, you are a saint. And so we really believe that a big part of our job and our only hope of accomplishing the mission is investing in our volunteers. And so one small detail of the vision that our church has always had is that we really want to focus on spending more time doing more training and encouragement with the volunteers of our church. Um, now, I guess if staff members have strong, you know, concerns about that, they are, of course, always welcome to discuss those concerns with us. And we take all those into account. And so we know that we don't have the monopoly on good ideas. We know we don't have the monopoly on the Holy Spirit. And so I believe we have open ears and a ready heart to hear what our staff thinks about things and often solicit that response. Um, you know, if at the end of the day, staff members don't like us continuing the vision that we've had for 36 and a half years and continuing the vision that they've been working under for these years, then, you know, they have to make, I guess, hard decisions about whether they can continue to serve here with a happy heart or whether perhaps God would call them somewhere else where they could serve 
wholeheartedly and excited about the vision. I, I don't think I have much to add to that. I mean, we're, we're right in step with one another. I will just say, if there is any question on anyone's mind, we have a wonderful staff mm -hmm. uh, that I believe has been behind my dad and Pastor Phil's leadership. But I really believe in, and, uh, you know, I guess, I guess I could be wrong about this, but I believe they are behind <laughs> uh, Pastor Brian and I's leadership as well. And so I don't anticipate, you know, I... I by the way, we probably could get a little more monitor because had a little bit trouble hearing the question a, a little bit. That that would help. So, but if there is any, I, our staff is in lockstep with us. We are making some changes. That's always, uh, you know, challenging as we're dividing our responsibilities. Um, but we're we're in good shape. We're in we're in a healthy spot, I believe. Thank you, Fred. Other questions. Edgar. Hey, Edgar, how are you doing? Good. Hey, um, I w this is a question for Pastor Roger and Pastor Phil. What was, like, when was the time that you felt this is the time for us to retire and, you know, hand over the keys to Pastor Andrew <laughs> and Pastor Brian? When I looked at Pastor Phil and saw how old he was. Oh, and... no. Oh, no. You said for me to go. <laughs> you need a mic. Uh, no, you nope. know what? We, we both, um, through the years, you gain a lot of friends who are in ministry, and I know, and Phil does as well, dozens and dozens of pastors in um, wonderful churches across the country. And we have observed a number of times where, in our opinion, a pastor stayed longer than he should have. And um, it, 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 it's grievous to a church when that happens. And it's not healthy for the pastor and his family when that happens. You don't want to be at the point where people in a congregation are, are thinking, when's that old guy going to quit? You know, you want to be able to leave while the church is healthy and strong and while you still have the leadership of the church to make a healthy transition. And so Phil and I came to the conclusion uh, a number of years ago. It wasn't just recently. We concluded a number of years ago of observing a, this happen in a lot of churches uh, in unhealthy ways that probably 68 was a good time for a pastor to consider transitioning. And so when Phil was 68, when he retired, I'll be 68 when I retire. I, um, it's a challenge. It's, it's, it's difficult uh, for me uh, because I'm still, I think, in good health and I'm still in my right mind for the most part. And so, uh, and I still enjoy preaching I still enjoy ministry. I spent a couple of hours yesterday with a very sweet lady as she was dying. And it was a, just a moving experience. And I was thinking back while I was standing with her for a couple of hours by her bedside. I was thinking back of all the dozens and dozens and dozens of people that I've had that experience with. A lot of people go their lifetime and are never there at the moment of a believer's death and see the confidence with which they face death. And I, I've been blessed to be a part of that many, many, many times. So there's some things about ministry that, uh, that I love and that I'm gonna greatly miss not being the, the senior pastor. But I think there's a point where a pastor, for the good of the church, needs to get out of the way for the next generation. And I don't know that there's a, we set an age years ago of 68. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best approach of an arbitrary age. Uh, I think in our case, Phil and I for a number of years have recognized Andrew and Brian uh, as potential candidates to take our place and have invested in them and watched their growth, not only spiritually, but their growth in leadership. And we came to a conclusion that they were ready 
and uh, we didn't want to stand in their way. We wanted them to have the same opportunity that, that was given to us as young men to pastor a great church. And so uh, I don't know that there's any kind of clear lightning bolt from God. It was a growing awareness for me, and I think for Phil too, that, that it was time for us to trans, for the church to transition. Uh, if there had not been these two men that we felt were ready, then we may not have retired when we did because we would have waited until there were men that we could transition to because so many churches live and thrive for one generation, whatever the generation is of that founding pastor. And then it's disastrous after that because someone comes in, changes the vision, changes everything, and uh, does not have respect for the past and what has been accomplished. And uh, people begin to leave the church in droves. And it, it just becomes such a sad thing to watch. And so both of us were convinced that we did not need to leave until we had someone that we could clearly transition to in a healthy way. And for the last few years, we've been convinced that we had those two men that we could do that with. So I hope that helps. Okay. Just a comment. Um, I, I'm a fairly new member, and I, I just love the way that you preach, so that's why I ask, you know. Yeah. Because I love you, Pastor Roger. Uh, Thanks thank be to God thank, for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know what? You need to talk to th these two guys because they'll be in charge of whether I ever preach again. <laughs> I was just going to say it. Now, we'll get them right in a public setting. I keep talking about how much will you preach for us along the way. He said, well, when I retire, I plan on retiring, but I'm not sure he means that. So uh, I think we're going to hear him preach in the future. It'll be, it'll be good for all of us. Listen, there's a point of, of fatigue, and I may be at that point. I, I think that I've preached three times on a Sunday more than any human being that's alive today. I don't know of another church where they've preached three to four times on a Sunday morning as often as I have. These guys are a lot younger, but uh, they can tell you about the fatigue of that. I, I read a study some time ago that in, in preaching, your heart rate raises to over 100. And so when you do that for... Uh, three times on a Sunday morning, and so your heart rate is up over 100 for an hour and a half, I mean, that's like running a pretty good race. It, it, there, there is a point of fatigue, and so I feel it a little more than I uh, used to, and so uh, I'm not griping, I'm just explaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, pre I'll preach when they ask me. Randy. Well, Brian, uh, I'm not too worried about you. I looked at the Wednesday night service and what you built, and uh, I really think it's great. Uh, however, I want to know, you play guitar, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Are you going to learn the banjo so you can take Phil's place? <laughs> <laughs> you know, while I was uh, in Kentucky, which is the home of bluegrass, Pastor Phil called me almost every day. And I said, oh, Pastor Phil, are you calling about my theological studies? No. Oh, Pastor Phil, are you calling about my ministry development while I'm here? No. Uh, Pastor Phil, are you calling about my, my spiritual health and well-being and growth as a Christian? No. What are you calling about, Pastor Phil? Have you gotten a banjo yet? <laughs> and so in Kentucky, I picked up a banjo and learned a few licks. Um, but, and I know this is blasphemous, somewhere along the way, I sold the banjo and converted it to a bass guitar. <laughs> so, um, so no, I will probably not be doing a ton of banjo playing. Question I asked you this morning, and I'll let drive. Yes. Okay, would you address that for the c congregation, please? And, sure. And thank you very much for your time. So uh, this morning, Randy asked me, he said he wanted to know one thing. If Pastor Andrew dies, so I don't know, if, well, but if Pastor Andrew dies, he said, am I prepared to be the sole senior pastor of Valley Baptist Church? And my answer was no. 
What I mean is this. I feel a lot like the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul said, now keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul who wrote one-fourth of our New Testament, the Apostle Paul who was God's hand-picked apostle to the Gentiles, the Apostle Paul who was the greatest missionary the world has ever known, and yet here's what the Apostle Paul says. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. If, God forbid, Pastor Andrew was to die and that left me as the sole senior pastor, in of my own resources and my own power and my own strength, no, I could not be the senior pastor of this church. Um, what I would need in that situation is a fresh outpouring of God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit and the prayer and support of our church family. The other thing I would say is this. You talked about the Wednesday night service that I built. So first of all, I would say God has built it. The second thing I would say is that God has built it with an army of people. And so the secret of the success of the Wednesday evening service is uh, my two wonderful helpers, Charlie Brown and Christina Jackson, who basically organize everything of the service so I can just show up and preach. And then our 63 wonderful table leaders who are the magic sauce that make that service so awesome. So I would just correct that I don't know if it's completely correct that I built the Wednesday evening service, but I appreciate your support, Randy. God bless you, brother. If you become the sole senior pastor and I'm under 95, I'll try to help you. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, they're coming out of retirement, all right. All right, other questions? Well, uh, Randy, let's let Daryl have a turn, and then uh, Daryl kind of beat you to it, but you can get in line to him there. Go ahead, Daryl. Yes, sir. Uh, part of my question to Pastor Andrew when he was voted in was if he was going to keep preaching the Word of God out of the Bible, like Pastor Phil and Pastor Roger has done for our church for so long, to bring God's Word. As we know, church, God did use the family to continue preaching his word. And I ask if you're going to keep doing the Bible. But also, I ask that the church really consider this because it's a good opportunity for the church. And the last question is, is after you're voted in, do we get to watch you and Pastor Andrew do takedowns on the stand. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's see here. There are three questions there. So the first one is, am I going to continue to preach the Bible? By God's grace, with everything I have any power over, my desire is always to preach God's Word. And I would hope that the greatest assurance of that is not my promise right now, but I would hope that the greatest assurance of that is my preaching it itself. That, you know, if you have any concerns about my preaching that I'm no longer preaching the Bible, then you should take that into very careful consideration. But absolutely, I believe that, first of all, that the Bible is inspired, which means that it is God-breathed, that the Holy Spirit superintended the process of the writing of Scripture so that all of the words of Scripture were exactly what God wanted them to be. I also believe that the Bible is inerrant, which means it contains no mixture of error. And so I believe everything the Bible says about every matter that it speaks to, including science and history and gender and sexuality and race and every other thing that the Bible talks to. I believe that the Bible says that Scripture equips believers for every good work. And so I believe that the Bible is sufficient, that the Bible has within its truth, within the truth contained in its pages, that the Bible is sufficient to help Christians know how to get saved and then how to live out the Christian life once they are saved. And so, I believe that the Bible is God's word. I believe that all the power in any of our preaching completely boils down to how faithfully we explain the truth of God's word for the people who are listening and as the Holy Spirit anoints that preaching. And so, absolutely, I am passionate about the Bible. I don't like teaching anything but the Bible, and that is absolutely my goal Lord willing, by his grace for the rest of my ministry. Okay, let's see. You had some other questions. One was a little bit to the church, so they have to answer that one. And then the third one was, um, oh, us doing takedowns. No. 
we are way too old and out of shape for that monkey business. So, yeah, I can hardly go golfing without getting sore, so wrestling is out of the question. All right, good question. Any other questions? Oh, yes, Randy. I just have a, a short statement. The churches that have failed that Pastor Roger just talked about, I've seen them fail too. The importance of this church is to maintain its culture, its guidance from God, the vision that was given to everybody who built this church. And I see that these two young men clearly understand that, and I think we're in good hands with them. And that's my statement. Thank you, Randy. For sure. Hey, Marjorie. How are you doing? Hey. Uh, um, as you know, I have three kids that have been involved in church when they were brought up in the church and were involved in the music program. But when my children fell away, I know there's a lot of parents that are like me that you pray for that child continually. And I've seen things progress in them. But <clears throat> in one of Andrew's sermons, this question is for both of you, for both Andrew and for Brian. In one of your sermons, Brian, you brought, I mean, uh, Andrew, you brought up that there are many kids that were in the church, that were brought up in the church, and there were quite a few that fell away and no longer participating in church. And when you said that, you, you didn't go further and say, and this is what we're going to do about it, or this is my thought on it. And, I mean, it was quite a while back ago, but I was just wondering what your thought might be on that, um, if you guys had talked about it, because I had also heard another pastor that was on staff mentioned the same thing. I just want to know if there was something you thought about. Thank you, Marjorie. And, and Pastor Brian can speak to this as well. I don't recall the context of, uh, of, of what I was sharing, but it is something that we think about and, and, and pray through. We want uh, our own to continue in the faith, obviously. So there's a couple things. Uh, number one is um, uh, we're not the church, just as a family, and parents aren't completely responsible for whether an individual, a child, uh, remains in the faith or leaves the faith. Uh, but I think we are responsible to really think through and prayerfully consider, are we doing the best that we can and what needs to be tweaked? And um, so uh, there's a lot involved in, in that, right? I mean, it's all, the body of Christ where there's a lot of different moving parts. We all got to play our part. Um, I will say that one of the things that if you just look at some stats and, and, and studies is if, if we get young people uh, involved in recognizing um, their involvement in the church, they have something to contribute. Um, the stats are amazing. The retention rate is so much higher. Um, and um, so involvement in service, involvement in ministry. Uh, because I think, I think kids are like all of us. We, we want to make a difference, right? We want God to use us. And so that's part of it. The other part uh, perhaps is just continuing with the vision uh, small group ministry, all of those different things. But at times, um, young people, we have to continually remind them of the main thing. And at times, uh, they, can start, uh, they can start getting... Um, we have to be very intentional. Let me say it this way. We must be very intentional about not, not getting sidetracked on, on things that are not the main thing. And uh, not that we've done that at Valley. I think that we've done a tremendous job. We just want to got to keep the main thing, the main thing, and helping uh, raise up disciples. And so that's explaining to these kids the why constantly. Why do you go to church? Why, why do you do this or that? Well, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And so there's not some secret answer that I have. Pastor Brian, I don't know if you want to uh, elaborate on that any um, but we got to pray for our kids. We got to keep investing in them. Um, and uh, culture is a is something, right? I mean, we're all we're we all we're not to be of the world, but we live in the world. And so, speaking their language in a way that they understand, uh, entering their world for the sake of uh, reaching them, 
We've, we've got to be very, very intentional about that. And students of the Word, certainly, but students of culture, uh, to understand uh, language that's used, environment. Um, you know, we've got a guy on staff. Well, I'll just tell you who it is, our drummer, John, John Wyman. He, he's always talking about vibe. <laughs> What's the vibe, right? Well, young people, that's, a, that's very important. What's the vibe? What's the atmosphere? Life group ministry for a young adult ministry, what's the vibe? Um, I will say this, that young adult ministry, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call myself a young adult, even though I'm inching up towards uh, that 40 mark here uh, in the next couple of years, but um, young, young adults that get on fire for the Lord uh, oftentimes are emphasizing... We, we need, this thing needs to be organic, right? Uh, and they, they're rebelling against what they think is organized, stale church. Ministry that's just, it's just organized. But what, I, what I've come to believe in the depths of my heart, that every organism that's alive is organized. So the church must be uh, organized for ministry. We have a lot of different parts of the body. God composed the body. As pastors, overseers, it's one of our responsibilities to help provide organization. But it cannot be organization alone, or our young people, will they will jet out of these doors as quick as possible. We must recognize that the body of Christ is alive, and uh, it, it's thriving. But we can't, we can't throw out organization at the same time. So we got to do both constantly. Uh, driving them home to the main thing, which is the relationship with the Lord. So, Pastor Brian? Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I would add, like Pastor Andrew mentioned, that you know this is a, a widespread problem in churches. And like Pastor Andrew said, there is no silver bullet that all of a sudden just makes every kid stay in church for the rest of their life. However, since this is such a widespread problem, there have been numerous studies done on it. And our, our student guys could probably even speak to this more articulately than I can. But... Um, study after study shows three things are very important. You know, they, they analyze the kids who stayed in church after they graduated high school and the kids who didn't. Now, there's an exception to every average, but on average, they identified three things. First of all, solid Bible teaching. A lot of churches panic. We're losing our youth. We've got to teach something besides the Bible because the Bible's not working. Those churches don't retain kids at all. So one is solid Bible teaching. And I love the fact that in every one of our you know, worship services for our students, that the preaching of God's word is the central component. And we don't shortchange that. Uh, the second thing is that the youth in our churches have relationships with adults who are not their parents. This was a key indicator. This is one of the many, 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 many reasons why we are so strong on life groups. Because in life groups, our kids get to build relationships with other good Christian adults who are not us. Now, probably every parent in the room has had that sort of frustrating but also funny moment where your kid comes home and says, guess what? I was at church and Mr. So-and-so told me this, this, and that, and that makes so much sense, I'm gonna do that. And what do you think as a parent? I've been saying that for 10 years. <laughs> but sometimes it takes the cool other person who for some reason they listen to more than the parents sometimes or they hear it better um, to impact their life. Now, I didn't grow up in church. My wife did. And she just the other day was telling me how impactful her life group leaders were growing up in life and how much they really encouraged her to grow spiritually. So one of the reasons we're so obsessed with life groups is because for our young people, life groups get our kids connected to adults in the church who can invest in them who are not us. A third indicator that study after study shows is um, that our kids are involved in the life of the church beyond the youth ministry. If their entire experience in church is youth ministry, then once youth ministry is over, they're not connected to anything and they fall away. And so that is something important that we think about quite a bit. For example, we have compiled a list of many ways in our church that young people can serve, both in their student ministry, but also outside of their student ministry. For example, we have you know, teenagers who help with VBS. Well, that's something outside of their particular age division. We have teenagers who help with the media. In fact, right now, 
back in the media center, there are teenagers helping volunteer with our media. And you know what's happening? They're getting connected to adults who are not their parents, and they're getting connected to the larger life of the church. Also, that's why for our student ministries, we don't provide a Sunday morning student worship experience. So there's a lot of mega churches where the students never have to leave their student ministry on Sunday morning. They go to their student life group or whatever the church calls it, then they go to their student worship service. And they get to 18 years old without ever having set foot in big church. Well, long ago, we made a strategic philosophical decision. Actually, not me. It was made a long time before I got here. That, no, we want our teenagers for their worship service to be big church. The church worship service that everyone else is experiencing as one step in including them into the larger life of the church. By the way, one of the proposed bylaw changes about lowering the age of voting is yet another step of getting them involved and responsible for the life of church beyond just their microcosm experience within youth group. So one of the things I love about Pastor Brian, he thinks and outlines. You'll notice that. You ask him anything, he's got an outline for you in your response. Incredible detail. Thank you. Great response. Uh, our church in recent years has figured out how important apologetics are for young people to be able to defend their faith uh, because they're bombarded with peers and, and teachers and later professors who uh, are articulate in denying the faith. <clears throat> and so we've had tried, we're, we've tried to have apologetic conferences. We'll probably do more of that and try to do more of that in the classroom uh, of young people as far as the curriculum. And with Pastor Eric, we anticipate doing um, apologetic studies that are recorded by various pastors in our church that will be a resource to young people. For instance, one, if they're struggling with creation versus evolution, I would love to see a detailed study on that from not only a biblical view, but a scientific view also that a young person could listen to from someone that they already know, someone they already respect. They could go on right now media and find that, but it would be even better if it was someone that was a pastor that they could go to for follow-up questions easily. And so we, we see the need for that in, in engagement more, more than ever, and hopefully these guys can make that happen in the years ahead. And Marjorie, I'd like to reemphasize that a church can do all of that and a parent can do all of that. And still, ultimately, it is up to the child to decide what they're gonna do with all of that investment by their church family and by their biological family. Other questions? Or are we done? What are you saying? No. <laughs> Any other burning questions? <laughs> We've been here a while. Yes. Hey, Ray, how are you doing? I don't have any major question or anything. I have a comment. Most churches run through a real difficult time at the resignation or, or uh, of, of a pastor. This church has done something that is amazing in that they have outlined secession and it has been major and it will improve the church as they continue, if they will continue that very philosophy throughout, the, even with Brian and Andrew. And by the way, all of my interactions with Brian has been great. Uh, I invited him to come to my house one day to pick up some books, <laughs> and he was like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm Christy Stott. Um, my question is, Pastor Roger, you kind of talked about this, but what is the background check for life group leaders that are not children life group leaders? How do you guys vet them? Yeah. Thank you. So maybe I'll take a swing at that. Um, so for potential life group leaders, uh, there's a couple of steps that we do. First of all, we do do background checks on all life group leaders, whether they're with kids or adults. So life group leaders are such a key leadership position in our church, we do background checks with, with all of them, from babies all the way to senior adults. The other thing we do is um, we run them through what we call NOMCOM. 
And basically what that means is we run them through a, a computer process we have where we run their name through the rest of the staff. One of the trick of, tricks of a large church is there's no staff member that knows everybody. But usually everybody knows someone. And so um, we run it through that process to sort of see if there's any red flags that might keep someone from um, being a potential candidate for that. The other thing is that we often will have meetings with them beforehand where we walk them through the leadership covenant, which is our expectations for the leaders of our church. We walk them through our membership expectations. We um, walk them through our statement of faith. And um, we also talk to them about what's expected in their particular position. And so we have them sign off on all of that. And then we should be doing training with all of our leaders, sort of training them on what we would like their ministry to look for as they serve the Lord. And so those are some of the steps that we take in that process. For a lot, for a lot of years, we did background checks on anyone working with a minor. But now we're adding to that. We're, we're, we want to do background checks on, on all of our life group leaders. And so that's something that uh, we've budgeted for because there's a cost related to that. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're as safe as we possibly can be. Matt, could you uh, speak to that of how the background uh, uh, checks work of what, what organization we use? So Matt Montana is our security director, and uh, we have gotten much better at background checks even uh, as of late since he's come on board. So. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Montana. Uh, Ma'am, just to answer your question, so we, uh, we contract with an organization called Protect My Ministry, and it's a pay-to-use service, and I don't know how much Pastor Roger wants me to get into it, but there's been some uh, glitches in that system. Some people, I don't want to say they've fallen through the cracks, if you will, uh, but we've, uh, we've revamped what we do, so we, not only we do, do we continue to do Protect My Ministry, but I've added three different checks. I independently check Megan's Law, I check with the United States Department of Justice, then I check with their Kern County uh, court system. And in addition to that, um, probably four months ago, we started utilizing another contract organization, which is a, um, it's very similar to what a private detective can use, where I can look up your address, I can look up your criminal, your criminal record. Um, then I'll actually contact those people. Uh, if there's anything of significance, and on occasion, I'm sure you can appreciate uh, sometimes things pop up in people's past that might be uh, acts of violence or um, potential concerns about activity or surrounding children. I will contact those people. I've actually, I will go to their house and uh, we have a conversation about it. And there's been times when we've had to put some hedges up around those people's abilities to interact with certain uh, ministries here at the church. Does that help you? Thank so you. The, there are no cracks anymore, as you can tell. I do this and I wasn't planning on asking a question, sure. but off of Marjorie's question, we do such a great job here of, uh, I see the changes already that uh, you're energy and um, ability to bring people and and how that's changing, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, not to say it wasn't good, but sure. I just mean like from transitioning to actually discipling people to equipping people, you know? I just wanna hear your comment on that because I think that uh, sometimes we do things for those that already know, mm -hmm. you know, like how to teach or something, but because it's such a big need now to uh, help those get a very firm foundation and then maybe answer questions on, um, uh, here's how you take the lesson that's in this, off the internet or you know, the Bible lesson and actually make it a lesson that the okay. kids are gonna wanna learn. So sure. I've just been on my heart for like about two months now yeah. and I just wanted to hear your comments. So Pastor Andrew's really been spearheading that emphasis within our staff and our church, so I'll let him speak to it. Yeah, I, w I would just say uh, not speak to the how as much, but just, just the obvious need. Uh, one of the things that uh, we can be guilty of, especially when you're in ministry for a long time and you're at 
the same church for a long time. I mean, I've, I've grown up in this church. This has been my church uh, except for just two and a half years where I was a member at uh, Highview Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I know I've been guilty of this, and I'm guessing all of us have been guilty of this, of assuming people know a whole lot more than they know. You grow up in church <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school. I mean, all, you assume people have a greater level of a spiritual maturity than they do, or let's just say even knowledge. Um, and so um, I have a different assumption now. I'm going to assume people don't know until we intentionally teach them and model it and walk them through it. Because in, in all reality, I think that's where, where our culture is at. Anyone who's coming, to, and we're having a lot of people come to faith in Christ, which is a wonderful thing. But now we got all these baby babies, these spiritual babies. What do, what do we do with them? Well, we need to assume they know nothing because most of the time that's the case. I mean, we, people come to join our church or to desiring baptism or accepting the Lord, and then you start having an interaction with, with them about what faith and repentance looks like in their life, and they're, oh, I'm living with my girlfriend or my boyfriend, and they've never, it's never even crossed their mind that that was sin. And so we're we're starting at a different place than we were a number of decades ago, just in terms of the culture. So that's the intentionality of recognizing that people, they don't know. There's a, there's a, there's a bunch of ignorance spiritually. But then also even with our volunteers, we're enlisting people. They, uh, they're eager, eager to serve. Yeah, I want to make a difference in the world. I want to reach the world for Christ, all of these things, because God's stirring in their heart. They've got to be taught how. How do you teach a lesson? How, uh, how do you organize a life group ministry with, with care groups within it so that the whole body of Christ is operating and, and the one and others of Scripture are operating in an effective and a healthy and efficient uh, way? And so um, I, think, I think we all were burdened with that uh, beginning. I, I know I'll speak for myself. COVID was a wake-up call for me, <laughs> a wake-up call of just, okay, uh, our people, not, not all of our people are in the same spot as what maybe we assumed they were uh, spiritually. And, and even myself, it was a wake-up call. God really used that to speak to my heart. So I hope that, you know, the how is different for every ministry, every division. Um, I could speak to it a little bit. We are having an emphasis on more face-to-face -face time with every single volunteer uh, in our church and planning strategic uh, training uh, times and face-to-face -face times, and um, we're, we're calendaring that and going to hold uh, one another accountable to that kind of thing. Okay, we've had some very good questions tonight, a sweet spirit. We have another Q&A uh, time planned. When is that? November 13th, at the Olive Drive. November 13th, and that one will be at the Olive Drive uh, campus. And so we hope you can come for that. I'm going to recognize Pastor Phil at this time for a motion. Okay. Could we also, I don't know if you mentioned September 18th. I did. Yeah. Okay, so let me read the motion that is being made at this time. Our motion is to, uh, my motion is to end debate and to postpone the vote on the Board of Directors' recommendation to elect Brian Busby as the co-senior pastor slash vice president-elect until Sunday, December 4th, 2022, with a vote by ballot of members proceeding without debate in all of Valley Baptist Sunday morning worship services. Okay, you've heard the, the motion that, uh, is there a second to that motion? Okay, we have a second. Any question or discussion? All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say no. Okay, that is so ordered. Uh, our last item, since it's an annual business meeting, is called new business. Uh, anything that you would want to bring before the congregation, you could do that. You don't have to do that, <laughs> but you could do that. So is there any new business? Seeing none, let me remind you that our next business meeting is September the 18th. Is that correct? 
September 18th. September 18th, correct. Uh, where we will vote on uh, the changes in the bylaws that you have before you, and we will be ordaining some men to the gospel ministry. At this time, if you will stand. We are going to have an adjournment. All in favor of adjourning, say amen. amen. All opposed may stay. Amen.